The Diachons often say that when you begin meditating, you should take stock of your mind. In other words, pull back a little bit and look at which direction your mind is leaning. Does it have a lot of energy or just a little energy? Is it thinking thoughts about the past, thoughts about the future? Things it likes, things it doesn't like. We try to do some course correction. There's an English term for this. It's called metacognition. When you step back and observe your mind, the mind observing the mind. And it's an important skill in the, in the practice as a whole. It starts from the very beginning. Think about the Sutta with the Kalamas. Where they were uncertain about what teaching they should follow. And the Buddha said, Well, you put a teaching to the test. When you act on certain qualities in the mind, what are the results? That means that you don't fully commit yourself. You watch. Then you step back a bit. If you're totally lost in a particular thought world, your perception of things, your understanding of who you are and the world you're in, is going to be colored by that world. It's like being in a bubble. Some bubbles are pink, some bubbles are blue. Everything you see is colored by the bubble. You want to be able to get out. The Buddha talks about this particularly in terms of dealing with skillful and unskillful thoughts in the mind. He, he said he got onto the path when he realized he could divide his thoughts into two sorts. That is basically where the type of thoughts he later labeled as wrong resolve, imbued with sensuality, ill will, harmfulness on the one hand, and those that were aligned with right resolve, imbued with renunciation, non-ill will, harmlessness. Instead of just thinking those thoughts, he stood back and observed them. Where did they come from? Where did they go? Then he realized the ones that he labeled as wrong resolve he had to keep in check. The ones that were right resolve, he could allow them to wander as they liked. So notice he's stepping back and he's not just engaging in bare awareness, observing cause and effect. He could see which thoughts deserved being held in check, and which ones should be allowed to have some free reign. That means you don't hang on your thoughts simply because they're your thoughts, your opinions. You look at where they lead. This ability to step outside of yourself, metacognition, allows you to change course. Because we're not here just to observe what we're doing and say, well, that's the kind of person I am. You realize, okay, you've got some unskillful habits, you've got to change them. But then even with the skillful thinking, the Buddha saw that it had its drawbacks. You could think for 24 hours a day, and it would, even though they would be skillful thoughts, they could tire you. And when you get tired, it's easy for unskillful thoughts to slip in. So the mind needs to be concentrated. So what you're doing is observing cause and effect in your own mind, and developing a sense of dispassion, first for unskillful thoughts and even for skillful thoughts. Turn the mind toward concentration. Here the powers of observation are direct to thought and evaluation as you're trying to get the mind to settle down. Even though you're trying to get past thinking, you need some thinking to get the mind to settle down, because it has to have a sense of enjoyment in its concentration object, like as we're working with the breath. How can you enjoy your breath right now? 
You can read a John Lee's instructions for dealing with it. But do you enjoy that? What would you enjoy? There's lots to play with in breath energy in the body. So give your imagination some free reign. Think of the breath coming in and out through your eyes, through your ears. Think of coming up through the soles of your feet. If there's too much pressure in your head, think of things draining down through the spine and then from the spine going down into the ground. Play with different perceptions and see what kind of results you get. Again, metacognition. Stepping back a bit. But then when things are well adjusted, then you plunge in. This is where the mind really does get to rest, where it really does get absorbed. And allow the mind to stay there for a while. It's like cooking a dish in the oven. You put it in and you pull it right out. Or you turn up the heat fast. Turn up the heat high so it gets cooked fast while it burns. So you just got to let it stay for a while. When the Buddha gives his examples for the kind of discernment that develops out of concentration, he says, first you've got to get really good at the concentration so that the mind mature. And when it's mature, then you can observe it. Here again, metacognition. You step back a bit. You notice how the concentration is fabricated. You notice how it's composed of aggregates. You learn to regard them as constant, stressful, not self, alien, empty. Whatever perception applies, it allows you to see that the concentration, even though it's better than other ways of managing your mind, still has to be maintained, still has to be directed, it still requires effort to keep it going. The mind inclines more and more to something that doesn't have to be fabricated. So there are times when you engage in metacognition and other times when you allow the mind to rest. This skill is important, not only as you're sitting here meditating, but as you go through life. We talk about taking the skills of meditation and applying them in daily life, here at the monastery or even when you go away. And metacognition is one of the most important ones, where you can step back from your old habits. And no matter how much they may have claimed that they are you, they're your way of doing things. Just the ability to step back and question them. See them as strange. Think of being an anthropologist, watching this person in the 21st century. Now this person engages with other people. So this is one of the ways in which having a committee in your mind can actually be useful. You're not totally committed to one member's way of doing things or one member's way of seeing things. We're trying to train the member that can step back and observe the mind and pass judgment, wise judgment, seeing where things are either unskillful or where they're simply a disturbance, and learn how to let them go. So of all the skills you develop as a meditator, this is probably one of the most important, your ability to observe yourself. And the Buddha talks about the luminous quality of the mind. It's not a pure quality of the mind. It's just that the mind can know itself, can observe itself, it can watch itself. That's how we train ourselves. So you want to be like that cook, the wise cook who knows how to read his master, knows what the master likes, and provides more of that. Even when the master doesn't tell him, the wise cook observes. And 
and knows what to make, knows what to do. So again, this is not bare awareness or bare attention that we're trying to promote here. We're trying to promote the ability to arrive at skillful judgments based on observing cause and effect in your mind. That's how you keep yourself in line. Now, sometimes this requires mindfulness in the sense of reminding yourself that this ability to step back is where your true well-being lies. Because all too often the parts that are being examined don't like to be examined. It's like catching criminals, Fly, putting a flashlight on their activities. They don't want to be seen. And here the Buddha gives you what he calls governing principles. The first one is the world is a governing principle. There are beings who can read your mind. What are they thinking if they read your mind right now, whatever you're thinking? Then there's yourself as a governing principle. You headed on this path because you saw that you were suffering and you realized that a lot of that suffering came from inside. You basically loved yourself. You wanted to develop good things out of yourself. Well, you no longer love yourself. You no longer want to develop good things. And there's a Dharma as a governing principle, realizing that this is a very valuable Dharma we've discovered. That there is an awakened being, there have been awakened beings in the world. And they've shown the way. And they did it out of pure compassion. It's an excellent dharma. It leads to suffering, and it's a noble path. As I say, it's admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. You start with good principles. You apply them to your life and make yourself a noble being. So it'd be a shame to just let this dharma go. So all kinds of ways that you can talk to yourself. As your concentration develops, it gets easier and easier to see the benefits of this kind of metacognition. Before then, it's a matter of making sure that everybody, or at least the majority of the people inside your committee, are on on the side of genuine well-being, long-term happiness, realizing that it's worth the effort that goes into it. So there will be some back and forth. Your department is trying to convince you that they're your old friends, and your new friends sometimes seem really weak, but you can strengthen them, and it's up to you. Yesterday I received a letter from a woman who's an alcoholic, and she said she tried everything and she wanted me to give her a surefire method to stop being an alcoholic. And I must admit, making me responsible for this method to be surefire struck me as wrong. She's got to be on the side of making it surefire. That's the attitude you've got to have in the practice. You've got to be on the side of the Dharma. You've got to be on the side of your own well-being. So what if you can think, say to yourself, what if you can do to strengthen this ability to step back and pass wise judgment and to make the judgment stick? That's how you progress. That's how this ability to step back is useful in daily life and in the meditation. Because it's in this direction that freedom lies, the freedom that comes from pulling out and seeing where you've been creating suffering that you didn't have to, and you realize that you can let it go. You're not committed to it, and it doesn't have any hold on you. You're the one who's holding on. Think of that image of the fire. It's the fire that's clinging to the fuel, not the other way around. It's the fire that's agitated, and it's the fire that has to let go. And when it lets go, then it's free. <laughs>